Okay, so welcome to this webinar, Chat with an Expert, <clears throat> Frogs, Turtles, Salamanders, Oh My. Um, you are joining us um, today. Uh, you're, oh, sorry, this is put on by Clark Conservation District, and we are a non-regulatory agency who provides technical assistance to landowners, um, and we put on an array of different workshops, such as this one. We've also had another workshop uh, last month that we encourage you to check out. It's on our website. Um, and then next month, we will also have another workshop that's focused on stormwater facilities and how amphibians are using those. Um, so make sure to check out our website with any um, of, to, to sign up for any of those. Um, so like I said, my name is Ashley Smithers. Um, I'm gonna be one of your presenters today talking primarily about turtles. Um, our other presenter is Laura Guderian. Um, she is with the city of Portland, Oregon, and she has done a lot of work both with amphibians and turtles. So um, you will have both of us being able to chime in on both of the critters um, today. So just a couple of quick um, housekeeping things. Um, as I mentioned, this, sir, this is being recorded and you can visit it on our website. Um, and then these are the next uh, couple of our uh, webinars. Um, and then also we have a watershed stewardship class that's focused for on people here in um, Clark County. So with that, I'm gonna get it started. Um, we are first gonna talk a little bit about introducing what we're um, showing today. So both Laura and I have gotten some live critters um, and part of that is getting permits for them. So um, I'm gonna first have Laura talk a little bit about the critters that she's gonna, that she was able to get today and what um and how she was able to get that so go ahead laura awesome can you hear me okay yeah good so um basically native wildlife is regulated so um if you want to touch native wildlife catch turtles catch frogs that kind of thing um, especially if you're doing it for some kind of work um, or school you need a permit from uh, the department of fish and wildlife um, I every year get a permit from Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife so that I can do surveys and handle um, amphibians, reptiles, freshwater mussels, all kinds of critters. Um, so you just want to be really careful. You don't want to necessarily, I mean, I grew up catching frogs, right? So like, that's totally fine, but you don't want to be doing it to excess because you can end up harming and causing a lot of disturbance. So all of the critters that we have here today, both Ashley and I, um, we have permits to have them and they will be going back to where they came from. Um, in my case, these will be going back to ODFW or back to the wild where I caught them. Um, in Ashley's case, she borrowed them from ODFW. So uh, just so you know, um, just because we have all these critters, they're not our pets. We don't, add, you know, we don't advocate for having amphibians and reptiles as pets, um, especially natives, because they are very difficult to, uh, to keep and to keep healthy. So what else do you have, Ash? Sorry, my turtle flipped over. I was a little concerned about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I, uh, as Laura said, am borrowing these turtles as educational animals. So I have a plethora of paperwork that I have to keep with this and um, because these species are native and some of them are non-native, but um, I will share a little bit later with each individual species what their story is and how they got here. But um, just know that uh, the pictures that I took and some of it are these educational animals and we just really wanna make sure that you're um, not, Taking them as pets, um, I think the big thing to remember is creating really good habitat. If you have a pond or um, even if just like in your neighborhood, uh, you can create some habitat and then 
have the critters come there, but never be transferring your critters and um, making sure not to um, take them out. Because a lot of these species are um, have various conservation statuses, both in Oregon and Washington. They're a little bit different, and we'll talk about those individually with them. But um, there's just a lot of laws and regulations. And even if you take them out for like, oh, I'm just going to take it overnight or to show um, that ends up uh, risking them to diseases and other things and then they are no longer able to go back out. So we just want to make sure that you all know not to take them out of this pet. So if you guys have any questions about that, feel free to throw them into the chat. Um, and if I see any come in in the next minute or two, maybe we can answer them. Um, either that or we can go ahead and move on. Um, to Laura's presentation. Um, Laura will be talking about amphibians today. So, awesome. so <clears throat> I, we wanted this, Ashley and I wanted this webinar to be very critter based so that you actually could kind of get up close and personal with some of the critters you might find either in your backyard or in the nearby forest. So this slide that Ashley has up are um, kind of some of the common amphibians that you might find in Clark County. And I have some of those to show you today. Some of them I have live and some of them I have in video. So I'm going to share my screen if I can do this. Okay. So these are the critters that we're going to talk about today. So frogs, we have three that we'll talk about. Um, Pacific tree frog, red-legged frog, and bullfrog. And then there's three salamanders that are pretty important that you might find in a nearby pond. So Northwestern, the long toad, and then the rough skin newt. Um, before we uh, kind of get into seeing the critters and all the excitement of that, I wanted to just point out a couple of identifying characteristics so that you can kind of figure out which frogs which, basically, and then maybe I'll quiz you when I hold up frogs later. Um, so the first one on the left-hand side there is the Pacific tree frog. You can see it has a black line that goes through its eye, kind of from its nose down to back behind its shoulder. And if you look at its toes, it also has sticky toe pads. So it likes to climb, that's why it's called the tree frog. Um, and then the one in the middle there is the red-legged frog. Um, notice it has a little bit of kind of a line, but it's not as obvious of a line that goes around its back um, to its shoulders. Um, it's also quite a bit bigger, it's kind of the size of your fist, um, versus the tree frog is about an inch, inch and a half. And then on the right hand side, there's the bullfrog. Um, so that one is quite different. It usually is kind of yellowy, usually a bright green color, um, and they can get very, very large. I've got one here that I'll show you that's actually, it's, it's very large, but it's actually a baby. Um, it's only a couple of years old. So, and then if you look at the tadpoles at the bottom, you can see the difference in size. So that bullfrog tadpole is basically the size of your hand, whereas the red-legged is maybe the size of your finger, and then the tree frog is maybe the size of half of a finger. So they're different sizes and you can tell them apart if you see them in the pond that way. Um, and then also frogs versus salamanders. So both frogs and salamanders um, might start their life in the pond. And so a quick way to tell which one is a salamander, which one is a frog. The salamander has those um, feather kind of features behind the head and those are their gills, their external gills. So their gills actually hang out in the water and they absorb oxygen directly from the water. So if you have a microscope, you can look really closely at those um, gills and you can actually see the blood moving through them. It's pretty cool. Versus the tadpole does not have those gills. So they actually have gills inside their body like a fish does, kind of under a flap of skin. Um, so that's one way that you can tell if you um, were to catch a couple in a pond, you could tell really quickly if it's a salamander or if it's a frog. And then these are some of the salamanders that we're going to talk about today. So the long-toed salamander usually has kind of a yellow stripe down its back. The northwestern salamander is kind of solid, all dark um, and shiny kind of colored. And then the rough skin newt is called the rough skin newt because it has rough skin. It's, its back actually feels like sandpaper when you touch it. And I have a newt um, to show you all today. The newt also has that bright orange belly. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. And then if you look at the larva, one thing to note is that they're really hard to tell apart. So usually when we find salamander larva in a pond, we just say, okay, there's salamanders here, but it's hard to tell what species unless you find the adults. 
So for the most part, um, you can't tell species from the larva. They're very minute differences that are very hard to tell apart. So first I have a video that I'm gonna show. So I shot this video at Oaks Bottom here in Portland um, at a pond called Tadpole Pond. And this is a really cool pond that has, um, it was created specifically for people to go and visit and interact with the amphibians there. And so these are some of the creatures that if you went there, you might find them. And there are other, um, other places in Clark County that you can go to as well, where you might see these same animals. So, let's see. Let's see. Laura, how old are they, do you think? These were, um, these are long-toed salamanders that hatched probably in February, and they will be going through metamorphosis in another couple of weeks. So they'll be coming out of the pond in a couple of weeks. Sorry, it gets bright, it gets better. <laughs> Laura, we have a question about what do they eat? Tadpoles are vegetarian. So tadpoles are eating algae. They have kind of little scrapey um, sandpaper mouths that they use to kind of scrape algae off of rocks and sticks. Um, salamanders are carnivores. So they're eating all kinds of little bugs and critters in the water. Another great question is, what is the difference between a salamander and a newt? That's a great question. So a newt is a type of salamander. Usually it has a little bit thicker skin. Um, and it just has a, a little bit, it's kind of like the difference between a toad and a frog a little bit. Um, it has a little bit thicker skin. It can stay outside the water a little bit longer. Um, but they're the same type of species. They're, they're kind of the same thing. And to all of our attendees, um, we have both a chat and a Q&A. So if you look down at the bottom, you should see a chat and a Q&A. So if you have questions, go ahead and ask those in the Q&A, and then we can answer them either written or uh, verbally. And Laura, just so you know, we can't hear any sound with this video. Oh, I didn't realize that. <laughs> okay, that's good to know. Sorry, so these are tree frogs. <laughs> these are tree frog tadpoles. Um, these are a uh, very common frog that we have, kind of the grass green um, frog. They can be kind of any color, really, green, gray, brown. Sometimes they have spots or stripes, and sometimes they're just solid color. Um, but this is what the tadpoles look like. They're pretty small. I kind of think of them like ice cream cones. They have kind of the big body, um, and then they have the tail. That's kind of the cone. And then this is a picture of one, and I've got some live ones I'll show you in a minute, where it's already got all four legs, and you can see the mouth is still shaping. It doesn't have quite the gaping mouth to be able to go after critters. Um, so that's uh, 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 close to metamorphosis. Probably needs another week or two, and it'll slowly reabsorb that tail, and its mouth will finish. Um, kind of forming. So um, on to real critters in real person. So what I'm going to do is stop sharing my screen for a second and then I am using this beautiful white wall as my background to show you critters. Oop, this guy's trying to escape. Hold on, let me set myself up. Okay. So these are tree frogs, and I'm trying to use the white background so that you can see them. So um, we've got one tree frog up here, 
that is actually so far developed that he is climbing up the side of the container. I can turn that around, you can see his belly, maybe. There's his little belly. And then in the bottom here, we've got a couple of different ones. We've got a couple that already have their four legs. And then we've got one that's a little bit less developed. So there's this one, he's kind of hanging out all four legs and his tail is yet to reabsorb. And then these guys over here, we have one that's not quite as developed and then one that's quite developed. So those are our tree frogs. And um, if you can see, they're kind of the size of my finger. So they're very small in size. So then I want you to compare that to the next critters which is the bullfrog that I have. So the bullfrog tadpoles are much, much bigger. So these are the bullfrog tadpoles. I don't know if it's easier to put like that. There we go. So they're kind of the size of my whole finger, basically. So they're a lot bigger, um, very similar shape. And notice how big they are, but they don't have legs yet. So the bullfrog is one that will sometimes take two years to go through metamorphosis. And so they will actually overwinter as a tadpole and come out the next year. So that's one of the reasons why these guys are a little bit slower to develop. Um, and it allows them to get this big, really, because they have kind of a full extra year to eat and get nice and fat before um, they go through metamorphosis and come out on land. So that's our bullfrog tadpole. And then I'm gonna show you the bullfrog adults. So I've got them in the cage here. I'll take them out in a second to show you. I just want to show you, yeah, because there's some glare happening. So I will pull them out and show you. Give me one second if I can do this without him escaping. And get them out of the cage. Um, Ashley or maybe Laura, we've got a couple questions here while you're working on that. Uh, what is their survival rate? How many larvae actually make it as an adult? Oh, oh that's a good question. So if you think about um, like, a, I don't know if you've ever seen a frog egg mass, but frog egg masses will have, you know, 500 to 1000 eggs in them. And when you think about it, really only two of those have to survive to replace the male and the female. So um, very, very low survival rate. So probably in the fractions of a percent um, in terms of survival. So this is our bullfrog here. So a lot of people ask, what is this? This is just his hip bone sticking out in the back there. You can see he's got a tympanum, which is his ear, kind of right behind the eye there. Um, one thing that you can tell with bullfrogs is that if the tympanum or the ear is um, as big or bigger than the eye, it's most likely a male because they need to be able to hear and other males that are calling and compete with them. So this is most likely a male, um, but time would tell as he got a little bit bigger. And then if you can see his feet, he's got um, webbed feet. So his feet are webbed so he can swim through the water. So bullfrogs are very much adapted to an aquatic lifestyle. So they tend to spend most of their life in the water. And that's one of the things that makes them a threat to native species is that they actually will go after and eat native uh, frogs. So a lot of times if you have bullfrogs in a pond, um, they will consume all of the natives and that's all you'll have in the pond. So it depends on the pond a little bit, but that's one of the disturbances that these guys create and one of the reasons we don't like them. So. This is a species where if you, catch a, if you catch a bullfrog, either a tadpole or an adult, it's actually illegal to release them back into the pond. You have to um, either give them over to a state agency or you have to kill them. So this is our little bullfrog friend. He says hello. Okay, and then I've got one more. I've got a newt that I wanna show you guys. Let me put this guy away. Okay, and we have another question as well. Uh, and Go for this it. was regarding the um, tadpoles, when you say their tails are reabsorbed, can you explain how and what exactly happens? Yeah, so with the tadpoles, so if you think about metamorphosis, their entire bodies are changing, right? So um, a frog is going from being, from breathing with gills to breathing with lungs, 
They're going from being a vegetarian to a carnivore. Um, their body shape is changing completely from being an aquatic swimmer to being a hopping critter on land. So the way that I think about it is that during metamorphosis, basically their entire body kind of liquefies and reforms into the terrestrial frog form from the aquatic uh, tadpole. When that happens, they can't eat because like they literally don't have an intestines or stomach. Their mouth is changing. So they don't have the ability to feed and get nutrients that way. So the way that they do it is by reabsorbing their tail. So all of the muscle mass and all of the fin, all the protein in there is what's actually spurring that metamorphosis and feeding it and allowing them to go through that change. So um, a lot of people think that their tail falls off, but it doesn't. It actually reabsorbs. And same thing with the salamanders. They'll keep their tail, but they'll reabsorb the fin part, the kind of see-through clear fin part, and they'll also reabsorb their gills um, when they go through metamorphosis. So that's one way that they can keep um, their nutrition up, I guess, when they're going through those changes. So here's our newt. So I got this newt yesterday when I was out in the field. And it's a pretty fat newt. See if I can do this. There we go. So there's our newt. So this is a rough skin newt. And if you can see, I don't know how good the um uh, the focus is on my camera, on my uh, computer here, but their back is kind of bumpy. It almost looks like sandpaper. And I can, I think I can hold them up so you can see it's back a little bit. So you can kind of see the little bumps on the back. And then the belly is bright orange. And the belly is bright orange because they um, have a toxin in their skin. It's nothing that would kill a person or a dog, but it would taste really bad. So the idea is to kind of cause a predator to spit them out if they were to be eaten. So if you were to lick or eat this newt, you might get a stomach ache. That's about all that would happen. We don't really have poisonous critters here in the Northwest. But you can see his chin bobbing up and down. So he's, that's how he's breathing. That is quite a, a fat newt. Do you, do you it know is why? quite a fat newt. I don't know. It's past time for them to be pregnant, so I don't think that it's a pregnant female. I think I might have just grabbed it um, after it had a big meal, <laughs> because um, if you look at it, it's not like one size. Uh, one side of it um, is actually bigger than the other. So I think it's really a case of it's just digesting food right now. One thing that I think is really cool about newts too is um, how they're versus a lot of a lot of people know about going out and doing amphibian egg mass surveys and the eggs of the newt are a little bit different in that they just kind of lay these like single ones along a um stem um and they also just like do these big massive balls of newts that kind of float in the water um which is kind of a cool sight to see if you're ever like in a lake or a pond um in the springtime so and often you'll see them because you'll see that flash of orange if they kind of flip over to dive down into the water. So that's usually how you'll see them is you'll see that bright flash of that orange belly. So those are the critters that I have. Ashley, you're going to take it on with turtles or do we have any questions to answer? One of the questions, Laura, that came in, um, there's a couple questions that came in beforehand. Thank you, everybody mm -hmm. that submitted questions ahead of time. Um, one of them was, what, we can, what can we do in our local communities and schools about removing invasive species such as bullfrogs? Um, and I'll share a little bit about kind of what I've done in the past. And then I know, Laura, you've done a lot of this work as well. Um, the thing with bullfrogs um, is that they have these egg sheets that are that they lay out in typically starting about this time of year to like I see a lot of them in July um, and they have about 5,000 eggs in these egg sheets and that is um, a lot more than our native amphibians that typically have between like 20, 30 to about 200, 300. So um, they just are really big out 
competitors of our na native amphibians, as well as the fact that they will just eat our native amphibians. They know to fit anything that they can in their mouths. Um, and so one of the problems is that they live in these, um, you know, water bodies. And as Laura had stated, they have these huge tadpoles that actually will overwinter and spend two seasons um, in order to go from a tadpole to an adult. And so part of that just makes it really hard for controlling this species. So some people will go out and actually and trap them. Um, some people are able to have man, um, manipulate their systems, so their ponds. So if they have like a man-made pond that the uh, bullfrogs are getting into, then often changing that by just letting that water go down, especially in the winter time, um, when you can kind of start having it dry out, um, is really great. Um, and then, like I said, trapping um, and trying to remove as many, but unfortunately, it sometimes becomes a little bit of a lost cause. I don't know, do you have any success stories or any <laughs> so in general bullfrogs are very hard to get rid of because yeah. they're very crafty they're really kind of specially adapted to be able to um kind of thwart any kind of management so like ashley said um you know the main thing is that they kind of need full-time water um they need to be able to spend a couple of years usually as bullfrogs or um, as tadpoles sorry or even the adults are usually pretty tied to the water so if you can draw down a pond and dry it out for several months during the year, that generally helps quite a bit. Um, otherwise, a lot of it too, you can, if not get rid of the bullfrogs, at least minimize the effect of them by trying to make sure that you have a healthy ecosystem otherwise. So making sure that you have lots of plants, lots of insects, lots of vegetation, so that if you have natives, the native tadpoles can hide and get away from the bullfrogs and not be completely eaten by them. So sometimes it's also a matter of just trying to lessen the negative effect of the bullfrogs. Um, but bullfrogs are very tasty, I will say. Um, <laughs> I have taken uh, quite a few uh, fifth and sixth graders out to a fish hatchery to jig for bullfrogs and to just tackle them. Um, and the legs are very tasty. So always an option, just a little bit of olive oil, some breadcrumb, and uh, it's like a little chicken leg. So. Totally not. Kind of like oysters. You have to eat them or you have to turn them over. So just remember that. <laughs> yeah, they kind of taste like chicken of the sea. I mean, yeah. like oysters and like kind of fishiness. And kind then... of chicken of the pond, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't oversell it, you guys. <laughs> um, we have and... an, oh, I was going to say we have another question, Ashley, uh, that came in. Ashley or Laura. Do you have any good pictures of rough skinned newt eggs? I do not. If you Google rough skinned newt egg, it, may be, it might be different now, but um, for at least a dozen years when I was kind of first getting into this work, you could Google rough skinned newt eggs and Google had one picture. And it was one picture from this uh, professor that was raising newts in the lab. And so he was able to get a picture of the single egg kind of attached to a, the underside of a leaf. So um, I don't have any good pictures, but um, try Google. And at the very least, you should be able to find that one very popular photo that's out there. I think there's also one in the um, Amphibians of the Pacific Northwest book as yeah. well. Um, field that's guide. A really also great have. field guide. Yeah. So, um, I'm going to go ahead and move on to our next part of our presentation. I know that there was a couple other questions, but maybe afterwards we can um, go into that. So I will take over the screen sharing <laughs> and we will talk about turtles. So. Not working or are you just seeing the presentation? Uh, we see just there you go that's good. Okay perfect. Okay so I am going to talk to you guys a little bit about our turtles. So these are lovely pictures of all the turtles that I have today. I wanted to make sure you guys had a little good 
picture or a good view of it um, just in case uh, the, it, the video doesn't show up so well. But before I um, show off the turtles, I just wanted to give a quick intro. And this is um, each of the turtles kind of has a little bit different um, method to what they do, but I just wanted to give a general overview of what turtles are doing throughout the year. And I think understanding kind of the seasonality and what they're doing, you can start understanding what their habitats um, that they're using are, and then a little bit more about what you can be doing to help them out. So in the winter time, um, the turtles are essentially hibernating um, in the um, either the under level, as you can see. Can you see my my pointer on the screen? Here. Yes. You can. Yes. Yes. Okay. So they're either down here in this submerged vegetation where they will go in here and kind of burrow into the mud layer and hang out there um, between December or March. Or they're actually going into the upland areas and they're burrowing down into the leaves and the mud and the forest. And then, oh, let's see, okay. And then they, in the springtime, which is in about March, um, they come out. And so there's going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about the juveniles and the hatchlings later, um, too. And you'll see kind of this whole circle of what's going on. But um, basically, the adults will come out from either down here in the mud or from the upland area that they've been, and they'll just come out and they're gonna start feeding and they're gonna be basking on logs. And oftentimes in March, I'll hear people say, I'm seeing turtles out. And so that's because that's when they're starting to come out. And um, oftentimes they are basking because that's helping both like the female turtles help with incubating any eggs, um, as well as it helps with their digestion. Um, and also, you know, they are ectothermic animals, meaning that they are reptiles that are getting that sun energy and that's part of helping them versus like us how we regulate our um our body temperature kind of always stays the same um they have to go out and and bask in order to help regulate their body temperatures and so that's why you'll be seeing them out basking um, and then the juvenile hatchlings um so you'll see our turtle out i did a fun little animation um, out roaming around and then we'll see our little juveniles and they will be coming from their uh, nests that they've been hanging out in the winter and then they will be coming down into the pond. Some of them will be already in the pond and so they'll be just out there eating um, and hanging out in the pond. And a lot of what they're eating is both vegetation, all of those um, different floaty vegetation bits that you see in the in ponds, um, as well as um, different little macro and mac, um, macro invertebrates like bugs and whatnot. So they are eating both of those things. And so then in the summer, basically now through September, um, you're just going to see them out there um, basking on the logs. Um, and then uh, just continuing doing that, um, the, they're going to start, you're going to start seeing the females moving up into the uplands and oftentimes people in urban areas um, or, or around roads. So even if you're like in the, uh, a rural area and there's a pond on one side of the road and then like maybe a forested area in the other or there's a road just near a pond, you might see your, um, those females out there because they're actually look, looking for places to nest. Um, and so if you happen across one of those turtles, then go ahead and just help it along the way. Oftentimes we'll, sorry, my turtles are trying to get out, um, but they will move along, um, just help them move along the road. Um, and so just uh, looking for that. And then um, 
those females are going out and digging those nests and the uh, um and putting in some eggs which i'll show you a little bit later um and then they are uh uh the eggs will be stay they stay there for about like 72-ish days for western painted turtles and i'm not sure all the other species but it's around that same time frame and then um then they end up moving back um so here's our turtle and then our turtles going to find nesting areas in the uplands and then coming back down to the pond um and so then in the autumn like i said at the beginning with the winter the uh, little native or the little tiny turtles are gonna, the little baby turtles are going to be either staying in their nest or they are going to be moving down. They are gonna be hatching out of their nest and moving down to the ponds. Um, there's, I don't know that anyone's really figured out completely why they choose one of the two um, of these preferences, either staying over winter in the nest or moving down um, at, when they hatch out in the autumn. But um, they do one of those two things and then they are getting ready. The adults are starting to disperse and get ready to overwinter. So there's our little turtles going down. So then just a couple of fun life history facts. Um, again, these are for the Western um, painted turtle, but the pond turtle is also very similar. Um, females typically mature between the age of six and seven. You might ask how, how, how old do they get? They typically get to be in their thirties. Um, the pond turtle is about that to thirties. And then the snapping turtle can get I was reading like most things said 30 to 40 years old, but sometimes they can get to be much older. Um, you may have heard of some of our tortoises that can live into like their hundreds. So um, just know that if you were to get a turtle, just one second, <laughs> they are flipping over. Um, if you were to ever have a turtle as a pet, which Again, you cannot have these turtles um, as pets, but um, oftentimes pet turtles, people that have them know how they have to put them in their will because they just have these turtles for a very long time. Um, and so then there's also an equal number of males and females in the population. And so what's really cool about turtles is they can choose their nesting location um, and then basically the temperature that these eggs um, are at in the nest helps determine whether or not they become they are a male or a female turtle um, and so what's um, and then some of the larger females will lay actually twice in a season most times they only lay one um, nest so and then there's typically Scientists like to break them up into having hatchlings, juveniles, and adults. Um, and what's, if you guys are at all interested in studying turtles, where you should study is hatchling and juvenile stages because it's a lot easier, you know, with these turtles that live to be 30 plus years old and they are mature at like four to seven. Um, they spend a lot of their times as adults and they're easier, they're bigger to bigger, so they're easier to catch. Um, so adults are pretty well studied, but um, hatchlings and juveniles have, are definitely the area to study. So I'm going to show, um, talk about a couple of our turtles friends. So first we got the Western painted turtle and yes, they are in the state of Idaho. It's just that for this paper, the state of Idaho didn't give any uh, data. So this is just to kind of give you an idea of how they are all over um, and that's our species. So I'm gonna quickly show you a cool video of um, the turtle just swimming around. 
This is this guy. He's been hanging out in a tank with me for a couple days. And what's really cool about this is then you can kind of really see that underbelly of him and just kind of see him from the different angles. And there's the other two turtles hanging out there. So, okay. And then I'm going to stop sharing this. And then can you, uh, can you put me so that my, my camera is big, Zora. Can you hide? Thank you. Yeah. So, this is our first one. He is native to the Pacific Northwest. Um, and I'm saying he, and it's probably actually a she. But <laughs> uh, so, what's really cool about these guys, first of all, is that they have this beautiful underbelly. Um, and what it, I think is so cool about this part is that each one of these turtles, I'm gonna put them down for a second. Um, each one of these turtles has that, has a different design on that underbelly. And you can actually use it like we do for um, fingerprints on um, humans because to identify each one, because they're all unique. What else is really um, unique and a uh, distinguishing feature of these guys is that um, they do not have that red ear. They just have this beautiful striation. Hopefully you can kind of see that there. Um, and so oftentimes I'll, I'll show a little bit later how you can kind of tell the difference between them when they're sitting on a log and the red-eared slider, which is often confused with these guys. So I'm gonna, like I mentioned, this is an educational animal from the um, from Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. So I'm gonna just give you a little brief history of where this critter came from and why he's with ODF and W and gets to um, gets to hang out with us today. So this Western Painted Turtle was purchased as a hatchling from a Florida turtle breeder. And the turtle was purchased online, shipped illegally to Oregon, and then kept as a pet illegally until it was posted for sale on Craigslist. If you're ever trying to get away with something, don't put it on Craigslist, um, which is also illegal. <laughs> the turtle was confiscated by the Oregon State Police and brought to the ODF&W. Um, and the so Oregon and Washington laws are that you're not supposed to um, or with Oregon they do not distinguish between wild painted turtles and those bred in captivity but in both states you're not allowed as we mentioned at the top of the hour, hour to um, take the turtles out of the wild and keep them as pets so um, with that, it got compensated, compensated, and then now is um, here. So I don't know what else about these guys. Um, they lay about um, typically. It kind of ranges, but on average, about fifteen eggs per um, nest. Um, and like I said, they they come out in the this time of year, and they're basking. So you'll see them on the log. Whatever, what else is really unique about them is that they kind of have this flatter back. And I'll show you the difference a little bit later with both of these guys. So um, I'm gonna interject real fast, Ashley. Uh, for all the attendees, definitely put questions in the question box if you have them. And I have a question. Yes. What does the shell on top feel like? It looks like it feels slightly leathery or almost, I don't know, what, what does it feel like? <laughs> it's really smooth. I would say it kind of feels like marble or glass. Like it's really smooth and it's not leathery or hard or it's hard. So okay. yeah, no, that's like, a great blood, question. No blood vessels or anything in there? I don't believe so. It is a bone. 
so that's what's cool and as you notice with these guys you know it's there's the top and the bottom so the top is called a carapace is the scientific word for it and the bottom is the plaster or the belly and so on these you'll see that it's actually fused together and when these guys get to be so this guy this one is you know you can see not too big but they'll get to be about like nine inches um and i d unfortunately don't have a larger shell to show you of this one um but when they get really big like that you know things will chomp down on them and they will just burrow in pretty well and and be able to weather a lot of that a lot of predators for them are things like um coyotes dogs or pets um and just things that can munch them and when they're small little hatchlings which i'm going to put this guy down for a second um when they are, these are turtle hatchlings that were found dead. And so you can kind of see in there, um, it's been preserved. Hopefully it kind of can, there you go. Um, so these again are, it's hard to see, but about that big, um, they're tiny. And so they, um, when they're little like that, there can be easy picking for something like a bullfrog or a heron that's, you know, tromping through the wetlands and stuff. Um, to just be able to pick up and eat those. But then once they get pretty big, a lot of those uh, predators, it's harder to see or harder to get. Um, another predator, you know, is is us and our cars. Um, so that's, uh, that's something to just think about. It's just something that can end up crunching their shell a little bit. So. Um, Actually, we have a question. Um, yeah. That came in. Uh, earlier are you are you currently students or what kind of degree did you end up getting to be able to work with amphibians and turtles yeah so i um i had my undergrad is in biology and i did some work with some turtles um through just different biology jobs and then um i also so am so that was really geared towards amphibians. And then I went back and got my master's degree and through my master's degree actually studied the Western painted turtle in urban environments. Um, and so that's what I did. But, you know, if you, if you want to professionally work with these guys, you know, some type of degree in natural, natural resource sciences or biology is really great, ecology, but you can also, as a citizen, participate in volunteer opportunities um, such as Swamp up in um, Washington or down in Oregon. They have um, Metro has a whole program. I know Laura takes people out with her in the field. Um, and so if you just want to like volunteer and do that kind of stuff, there's definitely opportunities to learn. So. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and switch it over to our next species. So I'm just going to switch it back really fast. So, okay. So our next species is the Western Pond Turtle. Um, it is another native species. Um, it is native in um, it's ranges in California, Oregon, and Washington. Um, in Washington, there's only about six populations, so there's not very many. So it's actually considered an endangered species. So um, if you check out this slide, you can see some really good views of just kind of how its shell looks. Um, and it's a little bit more bumpy than the last one was. Um, and then you can see how it has kind of that speckledy pattern on its neck and such. So I'm gonna switch it back over. <laughs> um, so, okay, so again, this guy is considered an endangered species in um, Washington um, and so, you know, I have these special permits. He, there are not very many of them um, left in the wild. 
they, um, if you've ever been to the Woodland Park Zoo or the Oregon Zoo, um, you may have seen the Head Start program for these guys. Um, there you go. And um, so I was reading something that they think that there's about 800 to 1,000 turtles that have been, um, the population that has been increased through that effort with the two zoos. Um, there's six populations um, in Washington and there's no populations. This turtle used to be in Clark County, but they, it is no longer found in Clark County. So um, if you think you see one, <laughs> <laughs> then um, it's really important to re report that to uh, WDFW. And if you're down in Oregon and see one, then uh, reporting it to um, ODF and W is really important. Um, so this guy has been spending a couple days with me and is very charismatic and um, as you may have seen earlier, tried to escape his cage. Um, so the, a difference with this guy versus our other native turtle is if you look at the bottom of his shell, it doesn't have that pretty colors. It's just kind of um, a little blah of a color. So with his, you kind of see it's like yellow. There's, I have this other one that shows it's like very dark shell. And so it's just kind of this drab color shell. Um, and then it also is a little bit bumpier on top. Like it's not as smooth. It's kind of got a little bit of a ridges. But you'll notice the difference with this guy versus this is still pretty smooth in terms of some of the other species that you might see. But if you see this guy out on the log, you'll see kind of his little like helminty look and then you'll often see him at the side so you'll not you'll see that it's kind of this drab color here not that yellow and you'll also notice the speckling along here and not those beautiful stripes of the western painted turtle um so another thing that's really been impacting these guys is um shell shell wasting disease, which is something that's been happening to a lot of the populations in um, Washington. Um, and that basically is like the shell just kind of is just disintegrating and is like softer. Um, and so, and it kind of like starts eating away at it. And so um, they have been noticing that a lot of the turtles that have gone through the um, rehab program have gotten those and so it's something that um, WDFW is working on. So there's a lot of research and money going into these guys right now because they are um, petitioned for the endangered species list. So there's um, California, Oregon, and uh, Washington are all working together to try to keep this species off the endangered species list. Um, and that'll just, you know, and help do continue research on them. So that is this guy. So, yeah. Put him back. And um, just to show you kind of another one of his shells to get an idea of their size. So that guy's a little bit smaller, but see, you know, here's my hand behind it. It's a fairly good size. Um, and again, the same thing where it has the shell that goes all the way through. So. Ashley, do they know the cause of the shell wasting disease? I am really don't know that much about it. Laura, do you know anything about that as well? Um, what I know is that there's a lot of not of unknowns. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of what I have heard. The states of Oregon, Washington, and California recently got um, a lot of money from the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, um, and that's one of the things that they're researching: is what exactly is it, and how they can try to reduce it in native populations. There are some suggestions, some evidence that the Head Start programs. Um, might be um, causing the turtles to grow too fast and their immune systems to not be able to withstand what they think is a naturally occurring, um, uh, something that's naturally occurring in the water. 
Um, but other than that, they don't know too much about it. Um, unfortunately, the only way to um, treat an animal with it is to like scrape off the parts of the shell that are spongy and infected and kind of debride those wounds. Um, and it can be pretty misfiguring for those critters. Yeah, I didn't want to put any photos of that up online. Um, and just, just to let you guys know a little bit about what this turtle, I forgot to let you know, um, he, uh, it's a Northwestern um, pond turtle and it hatched from an egg in the wild population down in Benton County, Oregon. Um, and it was found near the nest site of a student who illegally brought it home to keep as a pet. Um, and then the student eventually gave the turtle to a school teacher that then notified ODF and W um, and turned and they and then it was turned over to them. Um, so the ODF and W determined that the turtle was unreleasable due to the length of time that it had been in captivity. So um, as I mentioned before, like you know, don't be taking wildlife out and. Um, yeah, so on to our next species, the red-eared slider. So um, this species is an invasive species from the southeast part of the United States. It is a common pet turtle, and so that is oftentimes people, you know, after many years of having their pet turtle don't want the turtle anymore. And so they think I'm going to release it to a pond. And, um, you know, as we have talked about, they end up uh, like, like our bullfrog, the well-known bullfrog. Um, they just compete with, for resources for our native species. Um, you know, those basking logs and um, food. And so, um, they are just, um, it's not a good idea to release your pet into the wild. So I'm going to show you a quick video of um, the species. Oh, can you not see the share? Can you see the screen? Can you see the screen? No. Oh, no. Okay. Let me, let me go back. So Sorry about that. Okay, can you see the screen now? Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, so these are some pictures that you can see of the turtle um, and you can see how it does have, the red eared slider does have that same striping pattern like our Western painted turtles, but it does have a little different with this red ear up here. And then their underbelly um, is a lot different too. Um, so, I'm going to show you this video. Can they interbreed? No, not that I have heard. No, they're two different species. Um, so what's cool about this video is you can see the, um, western painted turtle over here. Hopefully you can all tell which one that is. And then, um, there is also the red-eared slider. And so you can kind of see when looking at the side that they're kind of similar, because but there's some, some differences. Oops. And then, so I am gonna stop sharing and now share with you this guy. So, okay. You can see my camera, right? <laughs> yes. So here is this guy. And like I said, you know, it has those stripes on the side. So people will see the stripes and think, oh, okay, that's our painted, but it also has that red ear. But don't let that fool you because there's variation in the um, turtles. And so well, hopefully it will. Um, and some of them, won't, that red ear will be hard to see as well. And so when they're sitting on a log, you can also sometimes see that they have the yellow here on the side because their bottom has the blotchiness. It doesn't have that pretty pattern. It's just kind of yellow with these black blotches. So, 
And this isn't going to be all red and pretty like our Western painted turtle. So, so this guy was confiscated in 2019, so fairly recently in Multnomah County. Um, and he was part of a animal cruelty case involving domestic pets. Um, and it was transferred to ODF and W um, and held for investigation during, um, during, or held during the investigation. And now that that's closed, he is now a uh, educational animal. So um, these guys also live to be about, you know, 30 years old. And I'm going to go ahead and get this other guy out. And, you know, so they're non-native. They're from the southeast. And um, this is our native turtle. So hopefully you guys can kind of see the difference between the two as they're sitting. So oftentimes you'll see both of them on the logs. Um, I know a lot of people talk about seeing turtles out at Ridgefield or um, at Steigerwald. And so they'll be both, sitting, <laughs> it's hard to hold two turtles. Um, they'll both be sitting out there um, on the log and how you can start telling if it's the native turtle is again, seeing on the side. I like to first see if I can see that red stripe along its neck ear area, um, where again, this guy does not have it. Um, and then the next thing I'll look at is um, if I can see along the edge and see the red, the reddish orange versus the yellow. So, and then of course, I don't know if it's flipped up, <laughs> you would be able to see that. And there's also a little bit difference as you can tell in the shape of the the top part of the shell. So this guy's a little bit more domed and has a little bit more wrinkliness to it. The other thing you can, if you happen to have a pair of binoculars or you see them up close, you can look at the back part of the shell and you'll see that this guy's is pretty smooth. This is our native turtle. And then this guy's kind of jagged and serrated, kind of like a bread knife. So those are the two turtles. Is there anything you should do, Ashley, if you see the red-eared slider or are they pretty well established? They are, they are pretty well established, but I would report them to WDFW um, or ODFW if you're down in Oregon. That just helps us know uh, if populations are changing. Um, oftentimes wildlife biologists were kind of tracking and so we want to know like if they're there. And then if you do happen to catch one, like if you find one crossing the road, again, if it's one of our native turtles, just help it along the road. If it's one of the um, non-native turtles, then I would go ahead and capture it, um, contact uh, ODF and W or WDF and W, depending on what state you're in. I know that we have a bunch of people from Oregon also joining us on this call. Um, and then, um, there's also the Washington Invasive Species Council that you can, they have a reporting, um, a really easy reporting app that you can fill out as well. So that's what I would do. Um, and, oh, I forgot to show. So this was a little uh, hatchling of the, and you can kind of see it coming out of the shell of the pond turtle, um, one of our natives. So. Again, the red-eared sliders are really small. Um, this is, they just had come out of a, uh, a they got it out of a nest. So um, they're really, really small, about the same size as, you know, our native turtles. And so, and then um, just to give you an idea of how big they can get, this, Again, my hand for reference, um, they can get fairly large. Um, and again, you see the shells together and then you can see that serration on the back part of the shell, which is kind of cool. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next one. So. Okay, 
So our final one is the common snapping turtle. And I'm not going to hold him up too much because um, it's kind of vicious sometimes. <laughs> but um, they are from the, their region is kind of west of the, or sorry, east of the Rocky Mountains, um, a lot in the southeast and Midwest and over in Northeast. So, um, they get to be really huge um, and they're a little bit different than our um, native ones. Um, their shell is much like a bigger armor. Um, you can see that those, the back is, has really big serrations um, and they also lay a lot of eggs per nest. Um, so I am gonna stop sharing so that I can show you this guy really quickly. Okay. So he is much, <laughs> we'll see how long this lasts. Um, they are known to be snapping turtles because they will, if cornered, snap at you. Um, typically they, this guy is just like, likes to spend most of his time nestled up in the corner of the cage. Um, but they, um, but yeah, when they're kind of captured, they'll, so a little bit different thing about them <laughs> than the other turtle is you'll see like there's, they have, it's kind of, it's still a little connected, but much different. Um, and their bottom shell is like really small. They also, if we notice their top shell is really bumpy. I'm gonna go ahead and set him down, but you can kind of see. <laughs> And then, um, is he young? Is he a baby? What's his story? Um, so his story is he was hatched or was hatched from an egg in the wild population in Clackamas County, found by a landowner who was aware of snapping turtles were our invasive species. Contact ODF and W, um, uh, to you know, to to clarify or to like to verify it. And then um, at ODF and W's direction, the turtle was captured immediately and brought to um, ODF and W. And then it was retained as the, um, the uh, educational animal. And it's not allowed to, you're not allowed to possess one of those in the state of Oregon. So um, I have a couple of fun shells from this guy. Um, I always like to say they're just kind of more like dinosaurs or they just have these plated. They're very, so unlike, you know, the first one that was smooth, this one's rough and has these big bumps and then these just huge notches on the bottom. So this is kind of a smaller one. And then here's kind of our medium sized one. And again, you can see those is just armored plater, like big bumpy rigidness. And then it's kind of cool because you can see the, you know, the skeleton inside. And then this is our big one. So you can just see it's just huge. And they can get to be just like huge turtles. Um, and so again, you know, just that really bumpy nest. Um, and so, you know, they're out competing again with their eggs. They're, they're just laying so much more than our native turtles. Um, and then they also are, um, uh, you know, just competing for that habitat and everything else that, that the other turtles are, so. And what do they eat? What? What do they eat? So again, they just eat um, vegetation as well as invertebrates. Um, so different bugs that are in the ponds. So. So they don't eat fish or anything because they're so big. Oh, they might. I don't yeah, know. they probably they might. But I know, like I I've read a couple of papers that have talked about um, how like the different gut content of them and. Um, it's typically a lot of like invertebrates and stuff, but they could also eat like, they probably could eat something smaller like tadpoles or something. Um, yeah, but typically it's just like a lot of invertebrates. So um, I didn't study snapping turtles, so I'm not 100% sure on that one. So, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share one last video with you all. 
share. So, um, and thanks for that segue, Zora, because this is them eating. <laughs> so, uh, you can see the video, right? Um, yeah. So one interesting thing about um, them, our native turtles and how they're eating, is that they actually have to go underwater. You'll see kind of how they grab the food and then they go underwater and that's just to help them be able to swallow. So they aren't going to be up above water and like eating. Um, on land, they're going to actually have to take their thing, go underwater, and that just helps with the uh, pressures in their esophagus to be able to swallow. So you see how the, the pond turtle just came down to start eating as well. So it's kind of a fun sight to see. Okay. So a couple of things that you can do is, you know, create some, this is both for amphibians and turtles, is create brush piles, create upland habitat, um, build platform structures. Here's a really great one um, that I helped uh, my friend Jim Holly put, make um, out in uh, Multnomah Channel, I believe. Um, and so they're really easy. You can just put out a pallet. There's a lot of different variations, but basically some place that they can bask. Um, and then plant um, vegetation around your ponds, both so that, you know, there's that good upland habitat for both amphibians and reptiles. Um, learn a little bit about how to identify them so that you can be able to report any sightings that you see of both our um, native turtles um, and like if you see an endangered um, pond turtle or if you see one of the invasive species. And then if you do see any nesting areas, go ahead and do stuff to protect it, you know, avoid those areas during those times, mark them out, and then limit your pesticide use and don't release your pets into the wild, um, you know, because they'll become invasive species or like your dogs, if they're running around in areas with turtles, they might end up going and grabbing them. So with that, are there any questions? It doesn't look like. So go ahead and put some questions in that question and answer box. I have one, actually I have two in here that we skipped over. One is gonna come from me and it's if people have further uh, questions or they want to do more reading. Um, do you have, do you, both for, for you for turtles and Laura for amphibians, do you have some suggestions? Yeah, so um, hopefully Laura is still on the time. Here is our contact information that you can um, contact either one of us. Um, we both know a lot about amphibians and turtles. Um, we just split it up so that we weren't both doing the same. Um, so feel free to contact either one of us if you have any of those questions. Um, I think some great resources are, you know, just different um, field guides. Uh, there is the, um, I don't have them on hand, but there's a, amphibians of the Pacific Northwest um, and there's also reptiles of the Pacific Northwest that are two really great just like ID books. Um, down in Oregon there is a conservation strategy book that has a lot of really good information and a BMP book um, that can be found I think on OregonTurtles.org. Is that correct Laura? Yes. Okay. Um, and they also have these really awesome little like uh, I don't know, ID guides that you can get from people. So if you're down in Oregon, um, they might be able to share it with uh, some of us up in Clark County too. Um, and so those are some good resources around. Um, and then, yeah, I have Another a couple of questions that also came in. Do you have one, Zora? Yeah, this one, um, is I think for Laura when Laura was talking, can you talk about identification of uh, frogs versus, um, via the sounds that they make? Can you tell yeah. if you have bullfrogs based on sound? 
You can, yeah. So there's a couple of differences. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, good. <laughs> so there's a couple of differences. So the tree frog is really the only native we have that makes a lot of sound. So again, that's that croaking, ribbiting. It's kind of our Hollywood movies um, frog because it's always used, of, the recordings of its call are always used in camping scenes in a movie. Um, and it will be calling anytime for, a, well, really any time of year, but it generally doesn't call in the summer, like June, July, August, September. It's usually too hot and they're just not as active. The red-legged frog calls underwater, so you can't really hear it. And then the bullfrog only calls in the summer. So if it's June, July, August, and you hear kind of a pig grunt sound, like ooh, ooh, kind of sound, that's the bullfrog. <sighs> Sounds like a ribbit or a croak. Any other time of year, that's your tree frog. So should be pretty easy to tell them apart. And that's good for me because I'm not an auditory person. So I pick critters that can't um, be identified by call. <laughs> And then we've got, uh, how do turtles breathe when hibernating under the mud and water during yes. winter? Does it have- Can I please answer? Can I answer? Does yeah, you can answer. I'm so excited. <laughs> this is the best question ever. I'm so grateful for whoever asked this question. So this is where we get to talk about butt breathing. Okay, I said it, butt breathing. So turtles, our native turtles have very special um, absorptive skin around the cloaca, which is where they go to the bathroom. And it's kind of like an amphibian skin that they can take oxygen up through their skin. So when an amphibian or when a, a turtle is at the bottom of a pond overwintering, they actually can like hang out there and that special skin around the cloaca can actually force the exchange of oxygen. So um, in part, they just really slow down so their needs for oxygen are very low, but they also have butt breathing. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why us uh, herpetologists are quirky. <laughs> Try to work that into your conversation sometime today. <laughs> we yeah. also got... Um, do turtles live along faster flowing streams as well? Um, kind of, yeah. I mean, typically the ones here we find in ponds, but they will often use um, the kind of rivers and streams to migrate around. Um, so I know that there's been sightings on the Columbia River, and so I think sometimes they kind of use those to move around. Um, I know that, I mean, typically we see them in the ponds. I've read a lot of papers about different stream, uh, streams that they use in like the Midwest and different areas. Um, so what's interesting about the Western painted turtle is we have our local species here, um, but it actually, you can find different varieties of that species throughout the whole United States. And so it's kind of fun because when you're researching um, the critter, you can see all these fun examples of it from everywhere. But yeah, they, they will use, um, different rivers and streams, but typically they like the slower moving areas for kind of basking and stuff. But I know um, some of the slower moving rivers like the Tualatin down in Oregon um, has a ton of them and um, yeah, but they are in the Columbia too, which if you've ever actually been in the Columbia, it's got a good flow to it, so. Do turtles vocalize at all? Kind of. I've never really heard it, but they kind of make this like noise. And I've heard, heard them hiss. What? If you, if you kind of, so if you kind of make them mad, they'll go shh, um, and they will hiss. Oh, okay. Um, and pull into their shell. So that's most of the vocalization that I've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. I have another turtle trying to escape. <laughs> um, I, think yeah. we, I think we've gotten to all the questions that I've seen in the question and answer and in the chat box. If, okay. If you're still on and you're an attendee and you have a question that has not been answered, go ahead and put that in your question and answer box. So I... Um, can I introduce my friend? Yes, let's let's uh, let's end with this. So this is a uh, yeah. Tell us where so you got it. Is, sorry, my dog's in the room too now, so he's going to be a problem. 
Um, so this is a, a land tortoise. Hold on one second. <laughs> With that, I'll just say um, a, a, one of the questions that came in ahead of time was what are some ways to familiar yourself, familiarize yourself with some of the local herps in the area? Um, I think watching some of these series of webinars is a great way. Um, finding some of the um, the field guides and then like I mentioned, there's a, a ton of different volunteer opportunities and so if you um, want to get out on one of those. That's a great Turtle. opportunity to Turtle. Awesome. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> alert, alert. <laughs> of course, the endangered species is also the one that's the most risk taker. So sorry, sorry to interrupt there. <laughs> yeah, go So ahead. I just want to introduce this is a different kind of turtle. This is a tortoise. So Ashley showed you turtles that are all aquatic. They live in slow moving or still water. Hold on one second there, Laura. Um, oh. I'm not, I'm trying to spotlight you and it. Here, there you yep. go. There we go. Got it. Better? Yep. <laughs> so this is a, a, a Russian tortoise. It's um, not an aquatic turtle like the ones that Ashley has been showing you today. This is actually um, a little guy that we found in the street and adopted. So he's about 10 or 15 years old. He's a little bit, um, he's about the same size, I think, as the turtles that Ashley was showing. But he's got some differences because he's a land tortoise. He doesn't have webbed feet. So he actually has these nails that he uses to scratch and dig. Um, also kind of profile wise, he's not, you know, sleek um, for diving into the water. He's kind of bulky, he's more like a rock. Um, and then he has kind of these very kind of fragile little little legs that I think are super adorable. Um, and then I did this, I attached um, a little pet tag with my phone number on it in case he gets out because he lives in the backyard in our garden. So that's what that's about. But this is just a little tortoise, different from all the animals, all the turtles that Ashley was showing you and that this one lives on land, never goes into the water. The ones Ashley was showing you, um, our natives all go in the water and spend most of their time there. Great, cool. okay. So I think uh, we are about ready to wrap up. So um, I'm gonna do this. And um, so if you have any other questions, feel free to contact either Laura or myself. Um, and then after uh, this webinar, after we close it down, there'll be a survey form that should come out um, if it doesn't, if you don't catch it, then feel free to go to our website and um, make sure to fill out that survey and let us know uh, what you thought. And um, if you want to join us again, we're going to have a next, our next amphibian webinar is going to be, like I mentioned, on stormwater facilities, learning all about them and their, um, and then what type of habitat they can provide for our local amphibian populations. Um, and so that's going to be on Thursday, July 9th um, in the evening after dinner from 7 to 8 p.m. So feel free to uh, go to our website and sign up for that. And then also we have that watershed stewardship classes starting in a couple weeks. So if we don't have any other questions, um, we'll go ahead and uh, sign off. But thank you all for joining us and feel free to contact us. Thank you. Thank you. Hey guys, thanks again.